Hello, my friends, Simon Miller from What Culture here. And look, I know you've been like, Simon, where are you in this crazy environment? Well, in case you did miss some other videos, I am actually going on tour with the Last Match Wrestling Musical, which from late April is going down the east coast of America. So make sure you buy your ticket today. <laughs> but it does mean I am going to be all over the place. But does the ups and downs stop? It never does, even with my WrestleMania voice. So let's take the finger of power and give the good bits an up, <laughs> the bad bits are down for this dynamite. And my word, it was crazy. That is mostly because, as you probably know, if you have indeed been on the internet recently, AEW decided that on this very evening, they were going to show the CM Punk footage from All In. I spent this whole two hours going, man, the internet is absolutely gonna break. Before all that though, we were gonna have our first match. This is when it all goes crazy here on ups and downs, because usually I am a positive Pete, and I'm going to remain a Pete that is positive, but actually, I thought we should have done something different. It was Samoa Joe versus Dustin Rhodes, or it was meant to be, and this all came together because, of course, Cody Rhodes just became the WWE Champion, so Dustin cut this amazing promo on the interwebs during the last few days. He was all like, oh man, I know I don't deserve it, but given what my family is doing right now, I want to be the AEW Champion. And I was like, well, why the flub? Can't we do this? Because of course he can just take on Samoa Joe because Samoa Joe can be all M. Bison like, ha ha ha, I will destroy you, you fool. And instead, Joe did reply and he went, sure, I'll fight you, Dustin, but it will be an eliminator match. Which of course means the title can't change hands. And look, in no world do I ever think that AEW should have put it on Dustin Rhodes. Not that I don't love Dustin, he's great. But if it had been for the championship, well, it would have just made you go, oh my gosh, on every single one, two, ooh. It just felt like a wasted opportunity and it's getting it down. This is actually doubly true too, because we never got this match, because as Samojo was walking to the ring, Swerve Strickland just went lol, and he whooped his ass. In fact, he beat him up so badly by throwing him into all the ringside furniture that we had to cancel this match, or at least postpone it until the end of the night. Now look, I am gonna give this an up, because I love every interaction between Swerve and Joe, but once again, can you imagine if we had done this and then spent the whole of Dynamite going, oh my gosh, maybe Dustin Rhodes is gonna become the AEW champion, because Samoa Joe is now injured. Just seems to be right there, like my bald head glistening in the wind. Don't know what that means. Let's move on. Oddly though, I am gonna throw another up in there from nowhere. I'm gonna give one to video packages. That's right. Because we had this excellent video reminding you of what did happen between the best friends last week and the fact that Trent has turned on Aaron Cassidy, which means the greatest pals are no longer buddies. We also cut to Renny Paquette who said that she tried to get a word with Orange Cassidy, but instead he's gonna answer all of this on Rampage. So I like that too. We're creating synergy between the shows and we're saying one story's gonna start here, but it's gonna end elsewhere. So yeah, I am gonna give that an up. I think AEW has done a great job with videos recently and it's important to catch people up with the narrative. Well, <laughs> we finally got a match. Thank goodness. Because it was the Cope Oakland and it also was Adam Copeland defending his TNT title against none other than Penta. And I'm sorry, we need to always make sure that we appreciate these contests. Because if you went back five years or even went back to the first ever All In in 2018 and somebody had walked up to you and said, Edge is going to be taken on Penta one day, you would have been slapped round the face. And to be honest, it would have been justified. Penta decided to taunt at the start of this because he loves doing that. But I can only assume that Copeland hadn't been studying his opponent because it did work. The masked man busted out all the moves and in the first three minutes, he was getting one, two oohs almost instantly. Ooh la He even tried to hit a pile driver on Adam Copeland at one point. I was like, oh my gosh, thank goodness he doesn't do that because of course Adam does have a bad neck when he hit a dive. Although he didn't hit a dive because Copeland just went, well, I'm going to walk in that direction so you can't hit me with one. I was like, man, <laughs> more wrestlers need to watch this you can just move out the way. It didn't really work at all though because Penta just continued to beat down on Copeland. And even when Adam decided, you're a luchador, so I'm just gonna start busting out luchador moves. Penta just beat him, and he beat him, and he beat him. And eventually Adam Copeland put on this like weird version of the sharpshooter, but Penta got to the ropes and he continued to beat him. But I do have to admit the match then did suffer a little bit because it went quite long and the fans weren't that loud at all. But I guess Adam must have sensed this. So he grabbed Penta and he gave this amazing power slam on the ring apron. And I checked, it's the hardest part of the ring. Poor Alex Abrahantes then got smashed trying to protect his client when Penta hit an avalanche code red. I don't want to keep going on about this, so you have to forgive me. But again, like 10 years ago, Adam Copeland wasn't allowed to wrestle because he had no head. And now he is doing top rope Canadian destroyers, essentially. 
We are not in Toto anymore, Kedda. Thankfully, he then realized that he was in a bit of bother, so he just hit the spear out of nowhere, and he got the one, two, three, and again. Maybe we could have chopped five minutes off of this, but I had a good old time, mostly because my eyes could not believe what I was seeing. Up. Of course, the lights went out after this, because Adam Copeland is essentially feuding with the House of Black. When they came back on, Julia Hart was looking at him going, oh, hi, don't look behind you, which Adam didn't do. They should have done, because Brody King was there, and he totally killed him. Now, the reason I like this the most, though, is because, of course, at Dynasty, it is going to be Julia Hart versus Willow Nightingale. So Willow Nightingale made the save. Once again, I never thought these two people were going to go together. And I was also like, wait a minute, there is a cope open. Willow Nightingale should challenge Edge. I also love drawing this too, because Timmy the Timekeeper was just hitting the ring bell as a bit like Tim. When has that ever worked? The answer is never. And they cut to the back with Ray Paquette again, and she was talking to Hook, Shibata, and Chris Jericho, because they were going to be a team. This is really weird. Because Ray wanted to talk to Hook, but Jericho cut him off and essentially said, Hey, Shibata, hey, wonderfully haired warrior, if you listen to me, everything will go right because I know what to do. I'm the quarterback here, obviously. I mean, I'm just speculating, but surely Christopher has to be going heel. I mean, he was a proper goober. Maybe this does tie into recent chat that has been going on online where everyone's like, oh man, I hate Jericho, so he's going to play into that. And even Shabbat got his word audio thing. And he was like, what's the deal with Chris Jericho? And he also told Rennie Paquette that he liked her necklace. You have no idea how much I enjoyed that. Goofy wrestling for life. Renee was then able to use her teleportation powers because she was also talking to Eddie Kingston and Mark Briscoe. And that was a bit awkward as they kept telling us they had a dog fight at the Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Adam Copeland then walked in and he was also talking about this dog fight so I was laughing when it got super good because Willow and Stokely Hathaway joined them. And the long and the short of it is that next week we are going to do Julia Hart and Brody King versus Adam Copeland and Willow, which I think is fantastic. But beforehand, Stokes was like, oh man, Adam Copeland, you saw what happened out there. So I think that Willow should challenge for your championship. Tony Khan, you have to book this. I need it in my veins. I do want to point out this whole segment was not planned at all and it was totally chaotic. That's actually why I think I enjoyed it. It was nuts. When we got to the thing that everybody was waiting for, it was time to cut to the Young Bucks. I mean, AEW even had a clock on the screen. They told you when they were going to show the footage. Matthew Nicholas Jackson set this up as well by talking about how important All In was going to be and how one man ruined it for everyone, or at least tried to. And the reason they are showing it is because they will be taking on FTR at the Dynasty pay-per-view. And as far as they're concerned, Cash and Dax are friends with this individual, who of course is CM Punk, although they never named him. So maybe the reason they weren't ready when they went out at Wembley is because they weren't able to do their pre-match routine, because there had been a bit of a barn burner backstage so they had to go be EVPs. They also made sure to send lots of love to Jack Perry. And then, yes, they showed the footage and it was exactly what you thought it would be. Punk was talking to Perry and Perry was talking to Punk. Eventually, Punk kind of grabbed him. Perry got out of the way and then a bunch of people ran in to separate them. I mean, you may see it differently. It goes on for about 10 seconds. And in terms of where I think we are now, well, it's exactly where we were five minutes ago. FDR also came out after this, and surely we are putting it to bed, because they were like, oh, man, why are we talking about this? We should be talking about AEW, because All Elite Wrestling is a great place. And if it wasn't for this company, maybe we would still be shaving each other's backs, which is actually something that did happen in WWE. At least you'd have a clean back. They also think that Matthew and Nicholas Jackson are focusing too much on their EVP responsibilities, which definitely proves that FTR are the greatest tag team of this generation. They will prove it in a couple of weeks. So I thought this was nice because it was one of those AEW hoorah promos and maybe we did need it if you were going to show that video. But I think now we really just need to move on. Listen, I don't care that they showed it. I wouldn't have cared if they hadn't have showed it. I don't think it affects CM Punk or Jack Perry or the Young Bucks or FTR. It just was what it was. But really, if you are a fan and given how big that event was, surely you must be a little bit pleased. Everybody for the whole year has been going, oh my gosh, I want to put my eyes on it. Well, AEW just gave it to you. So I am in two worlds once again. I don't think it was a good thing, but I don't think it was a bad thing. So once more, because this is a positive show, I'll give it an up. But do I think we should just put it to bed now? Yes. Yes, I do. Especially because what came after this? I'm not 100% sure it was the best one-two punch. So we saw this awesome Brian Danielson video that basically reminded you that the American Dragon is a great wrestler. When Will Ospreay came out to do a promo, and he was like, man, I haven't seen that Brian video. 
and I'll get to it in just one minute. Because instead, he wanted to talk about somebody's comments when it came to the grind of professional wrestling. Now, I'm going to have to fill you in here like Craig David, but essentially, during a recent interview, Triple H had said, hey man, if you don't want to get into the wrestling grind, I'm glad I didn't sign you. And a lot of people went, huh, well, he must be talking about William Ospreay. Now, clearly Ospreay must have thought this as well, because he came out and he quoted this and said, this is pretty rich coming from the guy. I want to remind you, I'm the messenger here. I didn't say this, that got to the top of the wrestling world because he grinded too, but he grinded on the boss's daughter. I started looking around this Airbnb and I was like, oh man, this is gonna go really, really bad. Now actually, the rest of this promo was brilliant because he made out that Brian Danielson is the best wrestler in the world, but Will Ospreay thinks he's the best wrestler in the world. So in order to cement that, he needs to beat Danielson. But I spent the whole time just going, oh my gosh, he just took a shot at Triple H. And listen, I've talked about it time and time again. I love a shot. If WWE wants to shoot AEW and AEW wants to shoot a WWE and it's all in good fun, you should be able to do it. But doing this right after the punk footage, well, I'm sorry to say, I do think it has to get it down. Oh, it's just a little bit much, especially because a lot of people watching, they may not know what the flub was going on. If we do move to the second part of the promo, though, I will switch it around and I will give it an up because I am so pumped for that match. When you hear Will Ospreay talk about it, you know this isn't a bunch of baloney. He really wants to have the performance of a lifetime. And given that it is Will and it's Brian, well, they probably will have a match of the year contender. So, yeah, up. <laughs> But please, now let's just leave it. We then had this really cool Julia Hart video which basically focused on her character. And of course it was Spooky Wookie when it was time for that six man tag. Because it was indeed Chris Jericho, Hook and Shibata taking on Shane Taylor promotions. And do you know what happened on Collision? Shane did add an extra member to his group and it was none other than Anthony Agogo. Now you may remember years ago, I talked about Anthony Agogo here on a video. <laughs> I just need to be transparent. And I hope he doesn't mind me saying this. I consider him a friend these days. So this does get a little bit difficult. So I will just be completely honest with you and I am gonna give it an up just cause I thought it was so cool to see Anthony back on my television set. I know first hat, this man has been busting his ass and he's way better than most people know. So I hope he takes this opportunity by the horns and totally smashes it. Cause again, he knows what he's doing. He just needed the platform. In terms of everything else in this match though, well, Maybe I'm being stupid, or maybe I'm just really tired, and you know, sometimes I do make mistakes. I didn't really get it at all. Because essentially, Shabbat tagged in at one point, and he was getting his ass whooped. That's okay, because he has Chris Jericho, and he has Hook. But just as he went to make the tag, all of a sudden, Jericho and Hook fell off the ring apron, like willingly, and they got into an argument, because Jericho was all like, Hook, you need to listen to me. And Hook was like, no, I don't. I'm young, and I have wonderful hair. I don't need to listen to anyone. This meant poor Shibata was just totally screwed. And even though he did apply the choke to Lee Moriarty, Shane Taylor then got in the ring. He punched Shibata right in the face, so Lee smashed him on the ground, and he pinned him for the one, two, three. Then conveniently, Jericho looked over and he was like, ah, nuts, I've totally screwed up. Now, of course, look, I'm sure this is gonna make sense eventually because Chris Jericho will go heel and you'd be able to turn, oh, you're a naughty boy. But look, I don't really understand this relationship between Hook and Chris Jericho. I don't know why Shibata was involved here. It just all feels a little bit strange and I can't put two and two together. Well, I can't put two and two together. Do you know what I get? potato. So I just think this is one of those things where we need to get to the end point maybe sooner than we were planning. And once again, if Jericho does go heel, because there are some crazy people yelling at him on the internet, I think that's fine. But yes, given how much wrestling there is on TV, this one ain't clicking for me, although I'm a big fan of everybody involved, it's getting it down. Renee was then with Dustin Rhodes and she was saying, hey, don't worry about it, your match is going to be the main event later. Once again, I kind of got frustrated here because Dustin cut this amazing promo and if the championship had been on the line, I'm such a nerd, maybe just maybe I would have believed he was going to win, but the title wasn't on the line and he lost anyway. What are you going to do? And I suppose you could call the Ghostbusters, but here we just called Takada. I didn't even know he was on this episode of Dynamite and he came out. Well, fair play to that guy, he got a massive pop. He was also taken on Cristino Argentino. I can't help it. My first reaction was, we don't need a card or a squash match. But even then, this went like 90 seconds or something. I just thought he was going to end him with a Rainmaker. 
but for a teeny tiny bit, they sort of like, really went back and forth. As soon as he had got the one, two, three as well, Akada got on the microphone and said, Pack, I accept your challenge for the pay-per-view. And of course, the bastard didn't like that, so he came to the ring. And even though they were going to have a fight eventually here with the Young Bucks, but FTR came out to make the save. But actually, I think the Elite must have had more HP here. They whooped all their asses. So it's just a way to remind you that when we do get to the pay-per-view, we are doing Akada versus Pack and the Young Bucks versus FTR. And that is totally getting up because, man, I cannot wait. But yeah, Akada didn't need Akada in a squash match, even though it was funny, because he was rubbing that Continental Classic title like it was a little bit sexy. Once again, don't get mad at me. That's what he was doing. This just kind of felt like it was there until we got to the post-match angle. That's a down. When once again... <laughs> I was scratching my bald head. So it's gotta be me. Please let me know in the comments below. But Freddie Paquette invited out Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm because of course they are gonna have their big match at the pay-per-view and they were gonna have some kind of a toast. And as soon as the glasses were given to everyone, the timeless one took hers and she splashed it in Thunder Rosa's face and she wiped off the makeup. That was it. Must have gone about 32 seconds. This is when Mariah May was here too and she walked to the ring because she was gonna have a match with Anna Jay. I sat there the whole time going, don't worry, Thunder will come out and whip her ass, you know, to get revenge. And she didn't come, and she didn't come, and she didn't come. When Mariah hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, surprise roll up, and she won. And I started to ponder what my existence was. That's also known as hyperbole, but I don't understand why this was the segment to build up a women's championship match at the pay-per-view, which is what this was. Thunder Rosa, as the commentators reminded us, has never lost that title properly, and now Tony Storm has it, so maybe they will have a big old smash fight. But they didn't, and instead they threw water into each other's seeing devices. So I'm sorry to be this guy today, but I do have to get it down because I don't think it serviced it well at all. Although I like this match between Mariah May and Anna Jay. I mean, one, their names kind of rhyme. Two, Mariah is very good. And three, every time I see Anna Jay, she does get better. So I'm giving that up. Anna also decided to apply the Queen Slayer after this, which is when Mina Shirakiva, I can't pronounce her name, you have to forgive me, from Stardom run out there. <laughs> Why wasn't this Thunder Rosa? And do you know how it ended? With them <laughs> both drinking champagne. Don't get me wrong. I love goofy wrestling, it's for life, and I love nonsense, but even for my tastes, maybe there was just a little bit too much on this episode of Dynamite. Or maybe I'm just totally broken from WrestleMania. It's one of the two. When we got this Mercedes Monet interview, and that's when I just realized, yep, I am living in the Phantom Zone, because I don't get any of it. But she was talking about the fact that she's looking forward to our match at Double or Nothing because she is going to become the TBS title as far as she's concerned. When she turned her attentions to Willow Nightingale, she was like, yeah, not a massive fan of Willow. About a year ago, when we were fighting in New Japan, she broke my damn leg. Just when she was getting going, though, the lights went out, and when they came back on, Mercedes had been laid out. And while you'd have to presume this was Julia Hart, because she loves playing with the lights, we never saw anyone. I guess because now we can tease that maybe, just maybe, it was Willow Nightingale. It's the thing. It definitely shouldn't be Willow Nightingale. She's the greatest baby face ever. We should just turn her into the best. I also kind of thought throughout all of this, and what do I know, that Mercedes should be a heel just by her cadence. So yeah, I'm not 100% sure waiting this long for her to fight in a wrestling ring is the best thing for AEW to do. Because when it comes to the former Sasha Banks, do you know what she's really, 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 really good at? wrestling. So once again, I'm going to get all the heat in the world. Maybe I'll stay off the internet again, but it does have to get it down because all I really want to see is Mercedes Monet get in that ring. It doesn't feel like we're getting there anytime soon. When we finally got to our main event, which was Dustin Rhodes versus Samoa Joe. And once again, while I would have preferred it if the AEW world title was on the line, at least it made Joe look like a flipping badass. Because he basically just beat the flubbins out of Dustin Rhodes, even though he had been attacked by Swerve earlier, to the point Dustin started to bleed. Because of course he did. I don't think I've ever seen a Dustin Rhodes match in the last few years where he didn't have red stuff coming out of his head. There was this absolute great bit though when Rhodes did get back into this with the power slam out of nowhere and the commentators put that over huge and he hit the crossroads and he got a one, two, ooh. Once again, that just made my heart sing sad songs. If once more I'm repeating myself, the championship had been up for grabs. I'm a massive geek. I totally would have bought it. Instead, Samoa Joe decided he would try and make sure everyone remembers that he is a heel and Swerve Strickland's meant to be the babyface because he was going to use the chain that Swerve loves to use when the referee went to get rid of that. Instead, Samoa Joe got his world title. He smashed Dustin right in his bloody head. 
and he beat him for the one, two, three. It also meant that Swerve could come out afterwards and absolutely whip Samoa Joe's ass before the locker room emptied to keep them apart from each other. And listen, these two are going to have an absolute barn burner at Dynamite. No, oh, Dynamite. <laughs> at Dynasty. And I do love the chemistry they do have. I still don't really get this Dustin Rhodes match. Look, I've said it about 37 times, I'm not saying it again. But it was a very good way to end Dynamite, and it did once again remind me, man, that Dynasty card on paper is going to be super duper good, so I am going to give it an up. But I do tell you this, in terms of episode of Dynamite, this one felt very hit and miss, and ironically for me, I don't even know why. But given that it is a positive Pete show, overall I am going to give it an up, and man, I tell you this, I would love to know your thoughts in the comments below, because this was one of those shows that is going to be talked about for ages, what do I know? Absolutely nothing. My opinions are rubbish, so definitely let me know yours. Also, please do like the video, share the video, and subscribe, and click the video on the screen, which is me talking about the ending or the restarting of Cody Rhodes' stories. But otherwise, yes, I'm now going to go to bed, and I promise the usual energy will be back with you soon. But I have no throat, so it's hard to eat, and it's hard to speak, and it's hard to sing. Not that I would do that, but I'll be back on my feet soon. I appreciate the support. Goodbye.